Hi guys, welcome back to Africa for Dummies. We uh, took a short break there, but we're back. Joined as always by me, Nathan, and my co-host, Mr. Zenge. Hello, everybody. Now, the IMF has dispersed over $16 billion to Africa as part of their disaster relief program. And these loans have come with some conditions. IMF conditions have not been very good for Africa in the past, i.e., the cocoa situation in Cote d'Ivoire, where the government failed to pay back the money to the IMF. And this led to increased pressure for cocoa producers to produce more cocoa. As you may know, Cote d'Ivoire is dependent on cocoa production. And this didn't turn out well as cocoa producers turned to child labor to meet the demand. Which begs the question, is the IMF good for Africa? To discuss this, we decided to reach out to an expert who is a professor from the University of Pretoria. He has served in various capacities, either as an expert or consultant in organizations such as the World Bank, Africa Development Bank, and the United Kingdom's Department for International Development, and many others. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Daniel Bradlaw. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you very much for taking the time to meet with us. I must say that trying to summarize your uh, qualifications was quite the (laughs) task, (laughs) I have to say. Um, I, I, <laughs> that tells you something about my age more than yeah. anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So to start the interview, some people may not know what the IMF is or what exactly they do. So just to start out to get people caught up, what is the IMF's job and what is its role in relation to Africa? So the IMF was set up, let me give you some history as background, I think. So the IMF was set up uh, at the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 to establish um, the post Second World War International Monetary Order, and it's in the job it was supposed to it was set up to do at the time was to oversee a system of rel- relatively fixed exchange rates um, based on a fixed link between the U.S. dollar and gold at thirty five dollars an ounce of gold, um, and the IMF would oversee that system by looking to make sure that countries were following the policies needed to keep their relatively fixed value of currency, um, and if necessary, giving them money to support them uh, in order to to keep that par value, the fixed value of their currency. That system ended in 1971. Mm -hmm. And since then, the IMF's role has been constantly evolved. So even though it's still sort of uh, technically an international monetary institution, the role that it plays is much broader than that. So it plays a much bigger role in regard to debt and to generally dealing with macroeconomic problems in in member countries. And so what it does is every year it conducts what's called a surveillance mission to every one of its member countries. Mm. And initially that was to see, is it following the policies that would allow it to maintain the balance of of payment situation that would be... uh, help it keep the value of its currency fixed. Now there is currencies are floating in value. So it's, it's looking mm-hmm. to see, does the country follow policies that are sustainable? Mm-hmm. Uh, does it have a debt that's sustainable? Does it follow? So, and now it's, so it's very broad ranging what it will look at. And that's been one of the problems. There's no limit on what's relevant to what the IMF, at least in theory, should be looking at. And now that the IMF is beginning to look at issues like inequality and climate change, Uh, there's almost nothing that's excluded from... Now, the the thing to to remember, though, is, I mean, it does this to every country. So once a year, it goes and visits the US Treasury, just the same as it goes and visits, say, the the Zambian Ministry of Finance. Mm -hmm. Um, When it visits the US Treasury, the, the US Treasury knows it will never need the funding from the IMF. So in, in reality, it can say, thank you very much. Your advice is very interesting. <laughs> um, you know, no, we've enjoyed this conversation um, mm. and then put the report on the shelf somewhere and forget about it if it wants, or it can take it seriously if it wants. Mm-hmm. A country like Zambia has to say to itself, 
you know, we might need money from the IMF this year or in the next few years. And so we better listen to what they're saying because when the money, when we do, if we do need money, the conditions attached to the money mm. are likely to relate to the advice that it's been given. So its advice is got to be taken a lot more seriously by a country that thinks it might need needs money from the IMF. That's that's actually interesting that you mentioned that because the um, and just going a bit back, the the whole uh, the IMF initially is normally um, uh, uh, like a. Uh, associated with debt and when, whenever there's a debt issue, you know, with the structure justice policies and so on, and how like its portfolio has expanded now. And you're talking about climate change, you're talking about all of these things. And in your recent article, I think in the conversation, you mentioned uh, the special drawing, um, special drawing rights was recently announced, I think uh, to the tune of about 650 billion um, for, for various countries to overcome the pandemic. So could you just explain to us, this is sort of like the latest, biggest thing that the IMF is doing right. and exactly what does that mean? And how does the average, you know, the average African who's an entrepreneur say, you know, in, in whatever business relate to this and how does it affect them? So the, the special drawing rights are, are called the reserve asset created by the IMF. So all the member states of the IMF agree they agreed in 1969 that the IMF had the power to create special drawing rights. Um, and so the special drawing rights are created. So what, let me just explain the, the special drawing right is a creation of the IMF. Mm. The value of a special drawing right is based on a basket of the five most important currencies in the world. So it's the US dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, the British pound and the Chinese renminbi. Mm. And so it's sort of a composite, a weighted composite of those currencies. So it's, at the moment, the, uh, the SDR is about $1.40 or somewhere around there mm. in value. But right. when the IMF creates this, um, it allocates it to the member states according to their quotas, mm -hmm. and which means effectively, and the quota is uh, in a sense your your share of the, your uh, contribution to the IMF and your ability to vote and draw money from the IMF. Mm. So it's, it's, it's allocated. So the richest and the most powerful countries get most of the SDRs <laughs> and the poorest countries get um, proportionately less. Of, of, yeah, exactly. But when you get it, it's what it really is, is the right. So it's a mm. right to get to convert your SDRs into dollars or some other hard currency. So the but countries when I am, whatever currency they want the money to be uh, drawn, basically. Then, so right. So what they could, it, yeah. but it's a bit. It, it when the IMF says we allocating six hundred and fifty billion SDRs, they're saying to. So let me use South Africa as an example. So they said South Africa, you're going to get about four billion dollars worth of SDRs. Those four billion are given to the reserve bank and go into the reserves of the currency of the country. Mm -hmm. right. um, and then the country can decide to do with it what it wants. It can use it to pay back debts to the IMF or to 15 other organizations that are authorized to hold SDRs. Or it could say to other countries that it owes debts to, we'll give you SDRs um, in, in, in order to settle the debts. Um, so that's a very limited use. The other thing it can do is it can say, I want to convert the SDRs into, say, dollars or euros. And it can go to the IMF and say, please convert these into dollars. And the IMF will say, okay, either you can go to another country, so most likely the US, and they will do it, or we will designate a country that we know has excess dollars to convert that into dollars. And then once you have the dollars, you can use it for whatever purpose you want. So if, for example, if Zambia says, okay, we've got the dollars, um, because the price of copper is going up, we're doing better than we used to, we, we'll just keep this in reserves mm -hmm. and not use it until we actually need it. Or they could say, you know, times are, are bad because of COVID. We're going to use this money to buy vaccines or to help entrepreneurs import and export things so that we, the economy can get going. They can do whatever they want with it. Um, so it's it's a big boost for countries, um, but it's 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 in limited form until they convert it into another currency. Now the only catch to keep in mind is that there's 
if you use them, there's an interest charge associated uh, with using them, yeah. which is <laughs> at the moment is very low. It's, it's I mean, mm-hmm. way below 1%, mm-hmm. but it could go up if interest rates go up. But so it's not a it's not free money like having dollars in your account. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's, it's sort of the way it was announced, it's almost like it's it's a big piggy bank that you know any country can just come and, and get. But obviously, there's conditions attached attached to attached to so, the money. Yeah. So the the only conditions really are that it's limited in what you can do with it. I mean, yeah. if Zambia said, you know, I, I mean, to be absurd, but if yeah. we're going to just distribute, take the four, whatever the the share was South Africa said, we're going to take that 4 billion and distribute it evenly amongst the population and just give everybody a one-time payment um, <laughs> of, the, of that. They could do that. I mean, you know, hopefully no government would actually do that, but <laughs> in theory that they could do that um, and just use it in any way they want. I mean, it's, it's six and 650 billion is about 5% of total reserves in the world. So it's a it's a big increase of, you know of money created out of thin air in a way. Yeah. <laughs> um so in, in that sense it, it is giving every country something more than they had and except for the the interest rate charge it's not there's no conditions attached. You made mention that with regards to the special drawing rates uh, you mentioned that the big most affluent countries are the ones that have more power. So do you think that these Western countries, for example, I believe the U.S. has the biggest seat. Do you think that the IMF kind of is heavily influenced by what they determine to be good or bad, for example? For example, you mentioned that climate change is a big issue and they're looking into countries to kind of promote that type of stuff. But what about a country whose priority It's not climate change per se because they have other burdening issues? So to what degree is this, how much influence does West, do Western countries or more affluent countries have on the IMF? So they, I would say they have a disproportionate interest, uh, mm. influence. <laughs> I mean, for example, the reason the um, SDR allocation only happened uh, last month and not a year ago, when it was clear that many countries needed it a year ago, mm. is because the US, on decisions like that, So the U.S. has about 17% of the total quota. Mm. In order to issue SDRs, you have to have, which is a big share. Though, as a footnote to that, you should know that if the U.S. share truly reflected its role in the global economy, it would probably have closer to 20%. Wow. So it's, it's, I mean, some of it's just a reflection of the role of the U.S. and its size in the global economy. But the effect is that it, because it has 17%, uh, and the, in order to issue SDRs, you have to have a vote of a majority of 85% shares, vote, uh, quotas voting for the SDR allocation. When Donald Trump was the president, he wasn't willing to agree. And so even though almost every other country in the world agreed there should be an allocation of SDRs, uh, the US blocked it until the president changed and then, you, then it could go forward. Which isn't too atypical of uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I mean, that's the danger with having, you know, someone have too much power. Is it? Mm. You get the wrong person there and it becomes a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. So the U.S. has a lot of influence. I, and it's not just the U.S. I mean, the Europeans as a group could have done the same thing. Mm. Um, I, I mean, China has a, a big vote, but it should have a big vote because it's a, a big part of the global economy. I mean, it, the part of the problem with the World Bank and the IMF is that they have what's called weighted voting. So unlike the UN, where it's one country, one vote, here your vote depends on a formula, which essentially looks at the size of the country's economy and its role in the global economy. I mean, you can debate, you know, one country, one vote means Lesotho has the same vote as China and India. Um, and if you think about the populations of those countries, mm. it's not necessarily fair that yeah. Lesotho should have the same vote. So what exactly fair voting is, is, is not such a simple question. So it comes down to an argument of representation or fairness, because if we're looking at fairness, it's going to end up becoming more about whoever has the most money or the biggest share, get the biggest say. But then again, if the IMF is meant to be sort of this major financial safety net, essentially, for the global economy, would it be fair for the richest countries to be the biggest, the biggest stakeholders 
and uh, you know does it actually help these like you know poorer countries to develop uh, in terms of its representation in the economy and what it can bargain for when it comes to yeah. finance, access to finance so it's a bit of a difficult I, dilemma in terms of the fairness and representation isn't it it, it is and it, it's a legacy issue in su- to some extent not completely but mm. i mean when the sdr was was created for example in 1969 Remember, for a lot of African countries, that was soon after independence, mm-hmm. and they weren't they were just joining the IMF and they didn't play an active role really. And so that what was being decided at the time was for the small, relatively small group of countries who actually were real the active and important participants in the global economy. Today, that's I mean, the world's changed dramatically from that. Mm-hmm. And so that it's it's no longer makes as much sense as it might have made. I, mean, I think you could debate whether it made sense even in 1969, but it, it certainly made more sense then than it does now. I mean, that's why one of the big debates now, just to, to give some jargon, is what the IMF calls channeling of the SDRs. Channeling so, of the SDRs. So what everyone says, okay, so the rich countries have got SDRs that they don't need. They're just going to sit in their reserves and do nothing. They should rechannel those and send them in a way that they can be used by the countries that actually need them. Mm-hmm. Um, and the question is, how do you do that? I was just going to ask that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, do, you, do you do it bilaterally? Do you say, okay, US, give me this amount of money, France, give me this amount of money, or is it all an agreed portion, you know, 1%, 2%, or 5%? Or... Well, so that's the, the debate. Um, I mean, historically, there have been certainly been some bilateral donations um, and some. Uh, so there's basically three three uh, options on the table, which they, I mean, in principle, there could be many options. But these three are probably the ones that are have got the most traction at the moment, not necessarily the best, but they've got the most traction. So the, the first is that uh, countries could contribute their SDRs to the IMF has a trust fund called the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust. And which is, uh, you would know from, that was where a lot of the money that was came through the HIPIC uh, debt initiatives. Oh, the, the uh, adjustment. Uh, right. right. So, so, it, so the, and there are two problems with the PRGT. One is that, um, it's only available to low income countries. Mm. So that's countries, you know, the poorest countries on a per capita basis, uh, yeah. whereas many middle income countries actually have serious needs um, that need to be met. And as you probably know, most of the poor people in the world now live in middle income countries, not low income countries. And so having the money only available to low income countries is a, is a problem. Mm. The second problem is, the SDRs, as they are now, as I said, are, don't have conditions attached to them. Funding through the PRGT, as you said, has is the, his, the legacy of structural adjustment. So they have lots of policy conditions. And what sorts of conditions the IMF might attach to SDRs now, of course, is, is, a, is going to be a big debate. And the history of the PRGT doesn't suggest... Uh, that one could be very conf- comfortable with the kinds of conditions that they w- could attach. And that, I mean, Africa in particular has a, a history of pain with in, in regard you know, to it, the... It's, it's, the it's, it's, it's a bit of a history there. <laughs> so, yeah. So, no. so that's the, the, the problem with the PRGTs, mm. is how do you yeah, so, deal with that? So mm. to simplify, basically, the, the, P, the poverty, um, you said poverty, inequality, and growth trust, right? No, poverty reduction. Oh, poverty and reduction, growth. right? Poverty reduction and growth. That um, that one is more strapped towards conditions, and there's basically a history and an awareness that this sometimes has bad consequences. Yeah. Whereas the structural, um, whereas the special drawing rights gives them more leeway uh, in in terms of what to do with their money. Oh, and right. I think this is probably a segue into another issue that I was, I'm burning to ask. Actually. <laughs> and Nathan knows this. Yeah. <laughs> um, we seem to be sort of like going around in circles. As you said earlier, the structure adjustment policy, you know, the IMF, uh, and for our listeners, just a recap, you know, the, um, in the 80s and 90s, I think the IMF came in due to massive amounts of unsustainable debt across the developing world and basically put countries on a track for liberalization and it coincided with democratization. 
but obviously this led to less government coverage on certain things like health at pretty yeah. critical times like the HIV and AIDS pandemic which is quite interesting because now we have the mm -hmm. coronavirus pandemic and also other conflicts in the DRC and you know between then and now obviously lots of things have happened uh, the rise of China I mean um, the BRICS also has its own you know bank although we're not really sure exactly where that bank is going so there's lots of alternatives to the IMF you'd think that by now there should be some different alternatives homegrown solutions either from Africa or, you know, does, is there, why, why essentially should Africa continuously have to deal with IMF? And there are other options, basically. Two things to keep in mind about that, I suppose. One is, yes, there are other options. I mean, there's the World Bank or the African Development Bank. And as you'll know, they, they were as much part of the Washington consensus and the conditions that were attached in the 80s and 90s as the IMF. Yeah. They've all evolved. And I, I, I mean, I think it's not accurate to say that they would expect exactly the same conditions then that they did now. I think they've been humbled and have learned that um, <laughs> they did, the lack of success. Now as well. Though. Well, it's also, I mean, they've learned that it failed. I mean, yeah. they've tried all these things and it didn't succeed. And, you know, hopefully they've learned their lessons and will, will be more different. And, Based on history, they've moved. You could debate how far they've moved, and I'm not saying they've certainly given up on austerity policies altogether, but um, they're much more aware of social of the social inequalities and the need to protect social safety nets uh, than they used to be. Um, but so it's, it's, it's a mixed picture. The only country for whom the BRICS Bank at the moment is an alternative is South Africa, uh, because it's only the BRICS countries that can borrow from that. I would say the I wouldn't be wildly optimistic that the BRICS Bank would be uh, that much more creative and uh, sensitive than any of the other institutions. The, the other thing, which is a big change, is that much more funding for African countries now comes from private sources than from official sources. Mm. So there's, I mean, and uh, the for example, the, 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 mar the, finan the bond markets, mm. banks, and they tend to be less policy, less policy conditions attached. Mm. And as long as you're paying back the debt, you're fine. But the minute you run into a problem paying the debt, they're likely to be a lot more strict than yeah. the IMF or any of the other institutions. So that's, so in that sense, uh, it's not. It is an alternative, and it's it's competition, and that's good. But it's it's it's. I would say, you know, approach them with caution. Um, so that it's it's a it's a mixed bag. I, the other thing to remember about the IMF and the World Bank is that African countries are members of those institutions and have yeah. rights as members of those institutions. And whether Africa uses those rights as effectively as they should is something that also needs to be thought about. And if not, then I think we also need to look at ourselves and say, you know, we need to make sure that our governments are using the, these institutions as effectively as they can. You, we've only got a certain amount of bargaining power, but we've got bargaining power. And whether we're using that as well as we could is, is a, an important issue as well. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the episode. Thank you very much for checking it out. Be sure to check out our Instagram page where you can get updates on the latest episodes and also get the opportunity to ask the fan question. Stay tuned to our YouTube channel for we've got great stuff coming there and you'll get to also see this episode uh, visually up there. Um, if you guys are liking the song, the name of the song is Point and Kill by Little Sims and Obi Janya. I'm not pronouncing that correctly. But yeah, thank you very much for rocking with Africa for Dummies. Now back to the episode. Actually, there was one question I also wanted to ask. An economist named, uh, you may not or may or may not know him, uh, Milton Friedman. He wrote this. Yeah. <laughs> he wrote a... a, a he, wrote, may not know him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he wrote a paper called well, No More Money to the IMF, basically. And in that paper, he basically stated that the IMF doesn't necessarily help developing countries and other countries, but only helps them postpone the inevitable the the time to pay back um do you agree with that statement or <laughs> or not <laughs>
The thing with Milton Friedman was uh, he was thinking mainly about rich people, I think, when, in all these discussions right. about yeah. free, uh, free <laughs> market. Someone agrees with me, Nathan. <laughs> 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 and that, um, I, because, you know, the IMF, it, it might be a problem, but it's a necessary evil in the world because. I mean, if, if a country is in really desperate condition, I mean, for example, if when Zambia stopped paying its creditors last year, if no, yeah. that nobody's going to lend first it money. Of an African country in the pandemic. Yeah. So no one was going to lend a, a Zambia any more money after that uh, from the private side. The only country, the only institutions that would are going to be the institutions like the IMF and the World Bank and the African Development Bank. Um, and maybe some bilateral creditors. And so you need you need that money. I mean, mm. it, it, the cost of not having that money is people in Zambia would have been, you know, would have had less money to buy the vaccines, to buy medicines, to buy protective gear, mm. to buy food in some cases. And so the suffering would have been much worse. The, so, you know, the conditions might be harsh. There might There's certainly problems with the IMF. But without it, I think in many cases, countries could be worse off. And one of the things to always keep in mind with the IMF is the amount of money it can give to Zambia is dependent on how much money the membership agreed to give it to do the business that they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And if it had infinite resources, it could give Zambia an infinite amount of money to deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. And then it would have to attach less conditions. I mean, I think, I mean, we know from personal experience that no lender gives you a significant amount of money without some conditions attached mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's always um, a catch. There's always a catch. I, and it's responsible. I mean, if you're going to give your money out to someone, you know, to lend it to them, you want to know that it's going to be used for the purpose that you yeah. want it to be, you think they should use it for. Um, and they're going to resent you if you start asking too many questions. <laughs> and that's just yeah. the nature of, of debtors and creditors. But the conditions of uh, part of the problem in the 80s was the conditions were ideologically driven in the neoliberal sort of height of the neoliberal order. But some of the conditions are if we're giving you a little bit of money, we need to make absolutely certain that it's going to particular purposes. If we can give you five times that amount of money, we can afford to be more lenient and to allow you to use it in a more uh, flexible way. And so that part of the problem with the IMF is how stingy other countries are in wanting to give money to the IMF. If they oh, wanted man. to say, instead of having a trillion dollars of resources, you could have $10 trillion of resources, the, the game would be a very different game. Mm. I'm not saying they would, you know, it wouldn't have conditions and there wouldn't be issues, but it would be a different set of issues. Yeah, definitely. And that kind of leads me to this other question in, Zambia has changed its president right now. And, you know, he's sort of come in and kind of shown people, hey, I don't have any money or anything like that. You know, he made a statement that um, the reserves are empty and, you know, he's doing things like traveling on a commercial plane and all these types of things. And the austerity, uh, austerity type yeah, of Exactly. At least and, on, yeah. on the outside. Yeah. Of, so of, he's, it, it seems yeah. like he's trying to show. IMF and other uh, organizations like, oh, we're, we're actually going to be serious. We're going to do this and all these types of things. Do you think that the IMF is going to buy his bluff or do you think they're going to be like, hey, look, this is the situation. You guys need to pay your money back. I, you know, at the end of the day, all finance is about money. Yeah. <laughs> and every creditor only cares about getting their money back yeah, at the yeah. end. So, I, I mean, I can't speak for the IMF, but I think in essence, what the creditors will say is, look, it's good that you're doing all these things. You're trying to convey a message that we approve of to the people. And we take, that's a sign that you're serious. But now we need to talk about how much money can you pay back? And on what schedule are you going to pay it back? Mm -hmm. And let's make sure that it's, it's, it, it suits our needs. Mm -hmm. What he, I think what he's hoping to achieve is to say, you know, we're serious. We want to pay you. We want to do it in a way that is consistent with meeting the needs of our people. Mm -hmm. And you need to take me seriously because you can see I'm doing what I can. I'm trying to convey all the right messages and I have a plan. Um, 
you might not agree with every aspect of the plan, but we can talk about that. But it's a serious plan. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I, I mean, if he can do that, then he gets taken seriously. Um, mm -hmm. Whether he, how much of it, the debate he wins and how much he convinces the IMF to change is, of course, that depends on negotiations. And, you know, yeah. I wish him luck. But yeah. uh, that's also interesting. Yeah, but that's also interesting about what these African, well, how, how, to the, the, the extent to which they can convince the IMF. Because, I mean, obviously the IMF looks at it also um, on a case by case basis. But, I mean, around the region, Mozambique uh, was seen to have, you know, sort of undervalued and not been extremely trustworthy when it came to talking about the, the amount of debt that they have, which caused a bit of shocks there. And then Angola is dealing with its debt with China in a different way. It raises some eyebrows, but it seems to have sort of um, settled down a bit. Uh, I'm not too sure. I haven't been following on that one. But basically, what um, what what amount of bargaining power do African countries actually have when it comes to uh, negotiating their debt with these um, international organizations? I mean, they have some bargaining power because you know, I mean, the, the creditors want to be paid back. They, they know that it has to be done in a way that is sustainable for the country, ultimately. The creditors I mean, can, it, can literally like punish the country, uh, so to speak. That uh, Punish is probably, I, I mean, let, let me, I suppose, I don't know, to be fair to the creditors, their argument would be, look, the country agreed when it took out the debt that it would pay it back on a certain schedule. And that, you know, the world depends on everybody living up to their promises. If the country is now breaking its promise, why should we be the ones that suffer? I mean, that's their, their view. And it's and a fair argument to me, yeah. If we can't, can't rely on people to live up to their promises, how does the world work? I mean, if you, if you can't trust anybody to do that, it's a problem. On the other hand, when the, countries, when the creditors lent the money to Zambia, many of them knew what was going on in the country and whether how likely it what, what the risks were and how likely it was that the country could actually pay back the money some of them were just hoping they could get the money they could sell the debt in the in the bond markets yeah. and get out before the the trouble began so they should also share some of the pain and some of the responsibility um so it's it's a it's a question i mean when mozambique essentially lied about the fact that it had borrowed $2 billion in a corrupt transaction and hidden that fact from its own people as well as the IMF. You know, that's, that's a very serious problem. And unfortunately, the people end up paying the price for the government's irresponsibility. But when it comes to the bargaining, it's a, then it's a question, there are two things. I mean, the, Zambia has bargaining power because the creditors want the money back and Zambia's I mean, nobody wants the people of Zambia to suffer more than than is necessary, given the situation in the country as it is. So that gives some bargaining power. Part of the question is, how do you use that in the most effective way possible? Um, and can the country make, you know, convince the creditors that when it says, look, this is the, we can pay you back, and we understand we made a commitment and we have to honor that commitment, but... I mean, the price of copper is not what it used to be. There are all sorts of other problems that we need to deal with. Here's a schedule that will allow us to pay you back that we believe we can live with. And that here's why we believe that. And here's what we're doing to make sure that the economy is going to keep growing and that we're going to meet all our obligations yeah. consistently and sustainably. You get a better hearing. You know, it's a question of bargaining power. How you increase your bargaining power in principle, the best way to do that is to have Africa bargain as a as, as a, a unit mm -hmm. rather than as a individual countries. But historically, getting countries to agree and to bargain collectively is extremely difficult. Yeah, I was just about to we, ask if that's realistic or <laughs> I, I can't think of any way that, even at least regionally, yeah. um, on an SADC or EAC ECOWAS level, at least, uh, that would probably be easier. Uh, in terms of bargaining, because I think collectively the SADC together would be around 700 billion in terms of GDP, 800 billion. I'm not too sure. Yeah, but remember, but around the creditors levels. of Zambia are South African banks, for <laughs> yeah. example. Which, which makes it more difficult <laughs> so, <laughs> to, yeah. to, to, so, to collectively so, bargain. Right. So bargaining collectively around the debts becomes difficult. Where Africa can increase its power 
is yeah. in saying in the decision making structures of the IMF, we need more representation and more voice. Now, historically, people have said the way to do that is to change the quotas so that uh, Africa, that the US has less or the rich countries, particularly the Europeans have less and Africans have more. The problem is Africa, because Africa hasn't been growing, if you mm. actually apply the formula, African vote, most countries' votes, would quotas would go down. There are a few countries where it would go up, but it, it, it's not it's not going to lead to a very happy outcome for the whole continent. But the one thing that has happened in the World Bank and could happen in the IMF is currently there are two executive directors at the World Bank. So that's like the board of directors of the bank that run the affairs of the IMF. Two out of the 24 executive directors represent sub-Saharan Africa. So that means roughly 22 countries are represented by one director. That, that's a very ineffective way of, uh, and very unfair way of rep having Africa represented because no human being can truly represent 22 yeah. countries with yeah. all their complications. It's just not humanly possible, I don't think. So one of the things that could change that is to say Africa needs a third representative, Sub-Saharan Africa needs a third representative on the board of the bank or the IMF. And that's happened in the World Bank. There are three yeah. executive directors, not two. And I, there's no reason that I can see why that shouldn't happen in the IMF. And that would, I mean, when you three voices out of 25 it, it changes the dynamics of the discussions. And usually the IMF makes decisions by consensus, not by voting. So if those three representatives make a strong case, you know, they know the other directors on a personal level, they're going to get a hearing that's, that's a fair hearing, and they can win some of the arguments, not necessarily all, but they can improve the quality of Africans, Africa's voice and representation in the institution. So that's very interesting because we, we, I wanted to just draw it back on, for example, when we were talking about the special uh, drawing rights and sort of the direct uh, impact. So, I mean, if the average African is thinking of special drawing rights, you did mention that the government can do whatever it can, whatever it wants to, more or less on an interest basis with the money that are uh, allocated to them from special drawing rights. In what way can ordinary Africans keep up with IMF affairs, like for example, youths? In what way can they keep up with IMF events and things that are going on around the IMF for them to be more aware of these things? Because often we hear about these things in very you know, technocratic circles and many people probably do not feel a personal connection uh, yeah. to the IMF. Right. And when you mentioned that the special drawing rights, actually, you know, the governments could literally be like, okay, one for you, the whole Oprah type of <laughs> situation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and not many people know that, you know, uh, news in many African countries, whenever the IMF is mentioned and the technicalities around that, uh, people will just simply pass by it. So the first thing is to not, I mean, I think a lot of people get scared by the IMF. They're intimidated yeah. by the fact that it's viewed in their governments and, you know, elites say that it's a very technical subject which is hard to understand and i don't think that's completely true so people can should just get over that i mean the the imf actually you can go to its website and you can sign up for all sorts of newsletters from the website you can get copies of uh, you can be on their mailing list so you get all sorts of information that they're releasing is one way um, you probably get overwhelmed but they have like a daily a newsletter that they send out the they all sorts of other um there's a they have a magazine that you can get access to i mean there also are civil society groups in africa that work on on these issues so i don't know if you know afrodad yeah yeah, um, yeah. so for example organizations like that publish information about the imf um, there's a, similar organizations in other regions so there's a eurodad there's a latin american dad um so those uh, are other ways um so i and I, I mean some of the ways is also to read the financial press um, mm. because that gives you and that also helps um, the demystify them yeah. the financial times um you know wall street journal i mean they're very expensive but you can at least 
uh, even in um, if you you know using things like that, you can get access. You can see the headlines. You can get a sense of what's going on in other parts of the world, um, and that's a way to to educate yourself and to know what's happening. I mean, uh, there are things in Africa also this, that carry articles on these, like uh, the Conversation in Africa does that. Um, so there are newsletters and things where this can be learned. Um, and uh, it's important to ask questions because, I mean, as you said, what happens with the SDRs? I mean, they go to every government on the African continent has got some SDRs now. I don't think anybody knows what's happening with that. I mean, yeah. I know they've gone, if, for example, into the reserves of the South African Reserve Bank, to the foreign reserves. But no one's the government. Up. And yeah, is the government planning to convert that into dollars and use it to buy uh, vaccines or to, to buy renewable energy? Mm. I don't know. And I suspect the same is true in other countries. And so learning more about that and, and saying, you know, as citizens, we have a right to know some of these things um, is, is also important. Because, I mean, at the end, the responsibility begins with us. <laughs> And yeah. us knowing and understanding and making sure that our governments are doing the responsible yeah. thing. Yeah. And this leads to our final question, which is, how do we make the IMF more accountable? And I think before, if I can add, actually, yeah, yeah. There's, an interesting, uh, there's an interesting case study where in Kenya, and I think I mentioned this in another podcast uh, sometime earlier, they, they, the people actually, you know, um, they're, they're netizens, they're citizens on the internet basically marshaled a campaign to send a letter to the IMF, basically refusing them to give the Kenyan, their government, more money. Mm. I think that was last year or the year before, which is quite interesting when you look at the sort of the sub-state level activism that people can have if they, you know, keep up and and keep tabs with uh, what's going on in the global economy. So yeah, back to Nathan's question. Yeah, so I mean, there are civil society groups in each individual country. I mean, part of the reason we know about Mozambique um, mm. is because there have been civil society groups that have brought cases about that to the courts in Mozambique and are saying, you know, you need to be held to account, government, for the way you misuse the, the money. So the IMF, I, I mean, it's it's somewhat accountable to governments because as members, they get to participate and to learn things. But citizens have very little Uh, direct interaction with the IMF. When the IMF comes on its annual missions to each country, it will meet at least informally with civil society to the extent that governments will authorize that. It will allow that to happen. The other international... Which varies depending on African countries. It it varies. (laughs) Some some countries are not very comfortable with it. Um, And also there's a concern... You know, I mean, which civil society groups get invited to the meetings becomes an issue. So it's it's, it's not simple, um, and it could definitely be improved. But all the other international financial institutions, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, have what are called independent accountability mechanisms. And if, say, uh, Zambian citizens feel that a World Bank project is harming them, that's leading to involuntary resettlement of communities or it's leading to increased environmental damage, they can bring a complaint to the, this mechanism saying, we, we feel we're being harmed because the, the World Bank or the African Development Bank isn't complying with its own policies and procedures, and that's harming me. And this independent accountability mechanism then will investigate the, the case and see, is there, has there been full compliance? And if not, Um, will issue a report which goes directly to the board of the the bank um, saying, you know, no, the the staff didn't comply. So this is interesting. So is it sort of like an area of arbitration or, okay, I wouldn't say it's a court of arbitration, but it's sort of like an area of arbitration for um, those who don't have the power of the state Mm. to hold these gigantic uh, so so there's two there are two aspects one aspect is to investigate it's an investigation to look into was there compliance by the bank with its own policies and procedures in all of the cases now there's a second part which is called dispute resolution that um, they will use their good offices to facilitate dispute resolution between the community that says we've been harmed and the sponsor of the project, which might be a private company, it might be a state-owned enterprise, 
but to yeah. try and resolve that. So you know, like with any dispute resolution. It usually it's either or. It can be or, both, but it I mean, because for the community, the community wants this problem solved. They don't really care whether the bank staff is doing their job <laughs> properly or not. Yeah, exactly. As long as they the, you know, their their problem is resolved. Yeah. Um, and because it's a voluntary process, it doesn't always lead to a, a good outcome, but it, it has in a number of cases. The IMF has nothing like that. It's the only one that doesn't have anything. It needs a mechanism like that. It would have to be a special kind of mechanism because it doesn't fund projects. So it has to be designed specifically for the IMF. But yeah. you can have a mechanism like that that would say, you know, if, for example, in Kenya, in the example, if the, they gave money despite civil society warning them of the problems of that the money would be misused, that that group could then come back and say, see, we warned you about this and you still went ahead mm. and we've now paying the price. We want that. It's the own will. Yeah. Mm. Um, or, we, you know, at least let's, you should look into why did the, the IMF not put conditions to make sure that the money was used in a responsible way. Mm. Um, and so that, and that would, Oh, I mean, and now, particularly because the IMF is beginning to deal with such complicated and political issues like climate change and inequality, the need for these sorts of mechanisms where people could raise issues, have them addressed, becomes more and more critical. Mm. And that would, I'm not saying it would solve all the problems, but it would go a long way to have restoring confidence in the IMF and mm. for making sure that communities and people get some of the benefits that they should be getting from these organizations. Yeah, certainly. I think that's a good way to conclude unless uh, Zenge has any other questions or? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually learning lots. Of, I'm, I'm literally taking yes, notes same. here. I'm actually learning a same lot here. Of, I, I, <laughs> think about, I never knew the Africa Development Bank actually had a dispute resolution or, you know, an investigative. Yeah, me neither. Um, me neither. You know, the whole idea, everyone just thinks these are really up in the air type of organizations that are, you know, yeah. as part of the club yeah. of leaders and, and so on, which is very interesting. And I think that's a big takeaway for a lot of our listeners, because many people, um, especially um, African youth, exactly. uh, really are completely detached yeah. when it comes to the IMF. Right. It's really so, something very think, distant. Yeah, I think it's very important. So, us, yeah. so you should go look on the African Development Bank website at the Independent Recourse Mechanism. That's the, the name. Yeah. Yeah. And in the World Bank, it's called the Inspection Panel. And you can see all the cases, because there have been a lot of cases in Africa in both, but I mean, obviously the African Development Bank's all cases are in Africa, but the in, the World Bank has also had many cases there. Yeah, that's, as Zenge said, I think it's very important for us as African youth to participate, or at least understand what's going on, because I think in the end, we're the, we're the people that are left to bear the burden uh, of some exactly. of the decisions yeah. that, uh, that they make. And as Zenge said, for me, I think I used to put the IMF in this box where it's like, oh, it's just for technocrats. It's just for, uh, you know, unless, unless are, you work with IMF. Or unless you work. Yeah, stuff. exactly. Like, things, yeah. things like that. So I think it's important yeah. to kind of demystify uh, what these organizations yeah. do and, 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 and why they're here. So thank you very much, Professor Bradlow, for, for helping us at least understand um, the IMF a little bit better. And uh, I hope that was very beneficial to all of our listeners. And we'll link the article Put from the conversation. Yeah, from the uh, conversation, for the uh, yeah, for the World Famous. Bank, all the, the, the links that you uh, put there. So on behalf of all the dummies, which we call our fans, <laughs> um, we, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> we thank you very much, Professor Bradlow, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure that was the most inaccurate thing you said. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stop me.